Good evening, and everyone. Uh, my name is Whitney Isla. I am a co-founder and COO for Onco Power. We are a digital health platform that has launched um, a an array of tools for both patients and oncologists um, in the oncology care space. And so we are so delighted to bring to you tonight uh, Mr. Mike Yule. He is uh, a therapist who has 44 years of counseling experience and has devoted the last nine years to working exclusively with cancer patients and their families. His emphasis has been on helping families understand that distress is a common and very normal side effect to the diagnosis of cancer. His goal has been to help patients and their families manage their distress optimize their quality of life, and promote healing in both mind and body. Mike, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, we already have some very interesting questions coming through, and I'm, I'm sure that our patients will be delighted to be able to have your expertise on board. Thank you, Whitney. I'm very excited to be here. Excellent. So let's kick it off. We had a couple of questions come through um, ahead of time um, on Onco Power. So I'm going to start with those. Okay. Um, CJ asked us, sh she said, I am an ovarian cancer survi survivor. Um, as an ovarian cancer patient, I find it hard to be on top of the development and cancer treatment. I have a type of cancer called germ cell tumor, which has a survival rate from 90% to 75%. I, uh, I have two questions. Does OC induce the onset of depression and anxiety? And does it persist even after NED, which uh, means no evidence of disease, which I'm sure you're very aware counseling in this space, but just for our audience members that doesn't know how important those three letters are. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, CJ, first of all, congratulations on being a survivor. Uh, it takes a lot of work and a lot of effort to get to there, and you and your team should be very proud of that. So the question you've asked is a very common and normal question, um, so I'm sure it's going to be uh, resonating with a lot of people listening today. So let me, let me take it in two parts. First question you said, does OC induce the onset of depression and anxiety? And I'm going to answer that in kind of two parts. Not everyone who gets cancer gets depressed or gets more anxious, but almost everybody who has cancer finds that depressed feelings and sometimes bouts of depression increase as well as anxiety. If you think about depression and anxiety as being responses to situations in our life, um, then yes, cancer is a big life disruptor, as you know. Um, one of the things that I think is kind of a good thing for um, the patients in, that I work with is that COVID has made everybody aware that when your life is disrupted, it can be very difficult to get back on track. And so uh, that is uh, what you're asking me is basically, I don't know that it causes or induces but it's not uncommon for people to find out that they deal a little bit with them, depression and anxiety. So from a counseling point of view, that can come from a situational perspective, meaning that the person is responding to the life-changing diagnosis, now being a treat in treatment. Uh, but then there's also the medical side, which I'm not going to speak about tonight because I'm not a doctor. Uh, I know it's Ask a Doc Live, but tonight it's Ask a Counselor Live. Um, and ovarian cancer, uh, in particular, hormonal and chemical changes in our bodies. But those can happen just with distress. Um, the neurotransmitters change. The, the amount of adrenaline and cortisol in our bodies change with any trauma. So it's not unusual for a change like a cancer diagnosis um, and the treatment plan uh, to cause or to bring about more depression and anxiety. And the reason I say it that way is uh, today I met a patient who said, everything's fine. I'm, I'm taking this in stride. It's happened in my family. 
Um, but not everybody feels that way right off the bat. Some people feel like, oh my goodness, now what's going to happen? And the fear of the unknown takes over and increases anxiety or the hopelessness and the idea, which is really kind of old school and at least 20 or 30 years old, the cancer is a death sentence. Um, so yes, it increases the likelihood of those two things. And some of it's psychological or emotional or mental. And some of it is chemical and hormonal. Um, we really in the counseling world don't worry too much about where it comes from. The goal is to get it back down. So I tell my patients, if they're experiencing a rise in anxiety or times of depression, the goal is not to so much to figure out where that comes from, but figure out how to push back against that. So what can you do to lower your anxiety? Can you do relaxation therapies? Can you do breathing therapies, yoga? Can you uh, do some cognitive behavioral therapy where you learn to thought stop the, th the thoughts that are causing you anxiety and substitute uh, more calming thoughts? Okay, so not everyone gets it. We don't know the direct cause. It's probably multifactorial, but everything that affects your body affects your mind. And everything that affects your mind affects your body. So that's a good question. Second question, does it persist even after no evidence of disease? Well, hopefully your body, if it's out of treatment, and I think you said that you didn't say much about whether you were in treatment, but after treatment, some of the treatment effects can diminish. Um, but, and I'm not a doctor, but I've just been hanging around with doctors for the last nine years. Some of the chemical changes in your body can persist and some can be permanent. So that's a good question to ask the doctor. But from a point of view of a life, life disruption and a psychological point of view, I, I tell my patients one of two things if they're trying to get out of a hole of anxiety or depression, but it's kind of like, um, do you need a jump start or do you need a new battery? So we start with making some changes and trying to change things, maybe sending them to a psychiatrist who understands cancer patients and uh, give them a chance to see if a chemical change can help get them out of the rut they're in like a jump start. Some patients find that uh, more than a jump start, they need a new battery. And so they need the, the uh, psychotropic medication which we have much better medication than we did 40 years ago, um, that they need the battery replacement. And so they need uh, that medication on an ongoing basis, okay? So it's very common. It's totally normal um, because as we go through life disruptions, it's normal to feel more scared or more anxious about the unknown. It's also normal to feel depressed or sad about things where we worry about patients or where we worry about people is when that depression is persistent and long lasting. In psychology and counseling, we usually think of two months, but I can be depressed for a month and be very disturbed and help be helped by counseling. So I hope that answers your question. That's, um, if not, is there a way for them to mm -hmm. follow up with, uh, in the chat with follow up um, questions? Certainly. And, and okay. also on Onco Power. So okay. that was helpful insight. So Thanks. our second question comes from Cynthia. She said, I have a similar question to CJ about non-small cell lung cancer. My husband is stage 3B and underwent concurrent chemo and radiation and now is on Infin-Z maintenance since November of 2020. Um, so far, okay, but has had severe depression um, particularly in the first three months of the diagnosis. The doctor said the depression is common among 30% of non-small cell lung cancer patients in the first year. Um, he, do, he continues to get bouts of depression on and off. Does this indicate any worsening of his disease? Um, it doesn't indicate a worsening of his disease necessarily, but sometimes the depression is like a downward cycle. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, people who are depressed get an invitation to dinner and they don't feel like being around people. So they isolate. And when you are depressed and you isolate, you feel worse. 
So the thing that you want to do is the thing that makes it worse. So it becomes a downward cycle. And so part of what I encourage my patients to do is cognitively look at what they're saying yes and no to and saying, you know what, I'll probably be less depressed if I go out with my friends. So part of it is a behavioral change. Uh, we call that running to the opposite, meaning that, um, that when you feel like you wanna isolate, you gotta realize that isolation might make the situation worse. Um, and your question is very good because um, the, the idea is how long has this been happening? Um, and you don't really say whether anybody did anything for the depression other than label it as, uh, you know, happens to 30% of people in the first year. Um, I, I'm just a huge fan of behavioral health. If you're starting to feel that way, you need somebody to talk to to help you sort out whether this is situational or chemical. Um, I, I specialize in lung cancer. I work with... Um, uh, the lung cancer team at CTCA, Cancer Treatment Centers of America. And um, I asked my doctor after I'd been working with him for a few months, so why do my patients who are a little bit depressed and maybe hanging on the edge get cancer and now need depress antidepressants and the ones who are on moderate amounts need more medication and some people have to uh, be bumped up to the maximum? I asked him, I said, is it the, the, the disease doing that to their bodies or is it the treatment? And he looked at me and he said, well, I'm the medical oncologist. And the truth is, I don't know, but that's a good question. It's probably both and because both are difficult on your body. The cancer diagnosis, even untreated cancer, it's very difficult for your body. And although the medicines we have nowadays are much lighter and we're much better at dealing with side effects, those can be very tough on your body. Uh, most, most of my patients suffer at least mild side effects of one type or another. And it's not unusual for that to cause um, fatigue. Fatigue is a very common side effect. And when people get fatigued, they instantly feel older. So I asked my patients, typically, I asked the guy today, I said, you're 55, how old do you feel? And he said, I feel 75. And I said, you've been in treatment in a year, a year and all of a sudden you're 20 years older. How does your mind deal with that? And he said, well, my mind is pretty discouraged because I didn't think I would go from 55 to 75 in a year. So helping him process that and see what he could do to push back against fatigue uh, is really the goal of therapy with him. So I would say one of the things you might want to uh, see about your husband, um, Cynthia, would be to have him uh, see a counselor, uh, either where he is in treatment, if they have social workers or behavioral health counselors or anything like that, um, or someone on the side. Most uh, insurance programs now are crazy about telehealth, uh, and telehealth is actually very good for behavioral health. Uh, because you can do it from the comfort of your own home and patients seem to love telehealth. But just to sit down and talk about what's going on and get a perspective from a mental health professional would be my suggestion. And start with a counselor and uh, move to a psychiatrist if the counselor or you think that medication would be helpful. Help, helpful advice. Thank you. Um, we have a question coming in from Liz. My husband is uh, has metastatic kidney cancer and has been having depression, anxiety, and has become an introvert. His doctor said that it may be because of his cancer. Um, any suggestion that you can provide on this matter would be appreciated. Wow. So he's become an introvert. That's an interesting phrase. Um, trying to think, I, I believe the, the best counselors listen to their patients and they learn everything from their patients. I can't think of a patient that I've had that described themselves as having introversion as a side effect. Maybe uh, isolation. If I think about it as isolation, I do have patients who um, get much more timid about going out, especially during COVID. Um, 
And all I can tell them is you have to balance the risk with your quality of life. Um, and um, I would hate to see somebody who was an extrovert become an introvert. My guess is that is probably fear-based, um, not knowing what's safe to do and not to do. Um, I know 30 years ago when my dad had cancer, every time he had a treatment, they told him, don't go out of the house, don't let anybody in your house. He was wearing masks long before COVID. Um, and we typically at Cancer Treatment Centers of America don't say that to our patients. We tell them to be careful. Um, and we encourage them to do good social distancing and stuff like that. But I would be worried about introversion and fear-based isolation uh, causing more problems than it solves. Hmm. Um, wow. Yeah. There's, um, there's another question coming through from Madeline. She says, you know, my anxiety never really goes away, um, particularly as a two-time breast cancer survivor. Do you have any suggestions for coping with this? Um, anxiety is, is a tough one. Um, I did say earlier that we don't typically as counselors try to figure out where things come from, but anxiety is usually based on the fear of the unknown. So if you were sitting in my office, I would probably ask you, tell me about what you're afraid of or what makes you anxious. And then we would talk about are the things that are making you anxious um, true and are they helpful? Um, this is a cognitive behavioral th therapy technique that I use with a lot of patients. Um, and I'll tell you why it works. It works because the most powerful things are not the things that others say to you, but the things you say to yourself. So self-talk is very, very powerful. So if I say to myself, uh, I work a lot with um, patients who have sleep problems. I, if I say to myself, you know, I had a bad night's sleep last night. Now I'm looking at the bed and it's bedtime and I'm checking my watch and oh my goodness, probably going to have a bad night's sleep tonight. Guess what? I just notched up my anxiety and just increased my chances of having a bad night's sleep. So what I tell my patients is tell me what's going on. Let's get the thoughts outside of your head. Let's put them on the table between us and let's look at them. So the example I use most often is I have two patients, patient A and patient B. They both tell me that their anxiety is rooted in the idea that I have cancer and it's going to kill me. I said, well, wow, anybody would be afraid if they thought that was true. But let me ask you why you think that's true. Well, I have cancer and it might kill me. And I said, oh, that one I could believe is true. But the other one that it will. So there's a difference. And your mind knows the difference between will and might. So if I say to myself, it's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna, I induce fear and arousal and anxiety. And I get the amygdala in my brain, which is the emergency center, the smoke alarm, I sent it off. And now my anxiety goes off. Whereas if I use my prefrontal cortex, the part of my brain where judgment is, I say, you know what, it's not true that I know it's going to kill me there. I'm, I might be one of the survivors. And in my practice, I've got survivors of 15, 20, 23 years, uh, and most of them didn't expect to make it that long. But, you know, we're making advances in medical oncology every day. So uh, the idea that it's going to kill me is different than it might. So I tell them, change that statement. Don't say that to yourself. Thought, stop the thought of it's going to and substitute the thought of it might. I said, now, truthfulness of that question can be discovered by a room full of people. We can all vote. Yes, that's true. We know that's true. The next question, though, is, is it helpful? Is very, very personal. So patient A says, you know what? I think that every morning when I get up, I have cancer and it might kill me. And you know what? It's motivated me to quit working overtime, spend more time with my grandkids. I started writing that book that I've been talking about my whole life. I jumped out of an airplane last week. Now, those are all real situations that patients have told me. So for that patient, it's not only true, it's helpful. 
That's a good thought. You want to keep that because you do not want to program your brain, which is nothing more than an electrochemical computer with bad software. No viruses, no Trojan horses, no malware of any kind. You want good software. Patient B goes, you know what? I tried that, Mike. And I think every morning when I get up, oh man, I got cancer and it might kill me. And I'm just depressed at the beginning of the day. It just makes my whole day. I said, well, we're gonna have to find a different thought because even though you've changed it to a truthful thought, it's still not helpful for you. So my advice is always program your mind with those things that are true and helpful. And if it isn't yes and yes, don't do it to yourself. Find a different thought that you can use because you will think about your cancer when you're a cancer patient. You cannot not think about your cancer. I hope that's helpful because that's a difficult problem. Yeah. But the anxiety is a, is a thing that can be dealt with. It's actually one of the easiest things to deal with in counseling. It doesn't sound like it, but it is. It, it's so incredible to just hear about the power that words have over us and like our own self-narrative has yep. over our health outcomes. Yep. So. We really appreciate you walking us through that just now. Okay. Um, we have a, a, another question come through um, from Jay Cummings. Um, I am a stage three adenocarcinoma of the lung um, patient for the past two years. I have a hard time, or, sorry, excuse me. I had a very hard time with the first year um, experiencing severe depression and anxiety. Um, this patient was on Prozac and Cymbalta for the first six months. For the past six months, um, it's gotten much better, but have still had episodes once a month. Are there other approaches such as yoga or diet that you feel could really help my, my course? Okay, great question. Um, I think the, uh, the question is important because yes, anything can help. Um, I'm not a nutritionist or a dietitian, so I'm going to uh, suggest that you find somebody. Uh, hopefully you have somebody like that on your treatment team or that you can ask Onco Power because I know uh, they- Yeah, have... I was going to say, I can make a quick little plug for Onco Power. We have um, registered dietitians that will answer questions for Perfect. you. Yes. Perfect. I know that can make a difference because I work with people who change their diet and it changes. My suggestion is that you, you just work on the, it sounds like the chemistry is helping you. It sounds like the prescription is helping you, but you're having some times of either breakthrough anxiety or breakthrough depression. Um, and so I would look for something that you can do when that starts or Look for something that you can do that is self-care that you can do on a regular basis so you that you lower that. Because here's what tends to happen with people. If I have a little anxiety today and I don't deal with it, I, I just put it on the shelf or I sweep it under the rug, whatever analogy you want to use. And if I do that every day for a month, it's going to spill off the shelf or become a lump in my rug. It's better to deal with it daily. It's easier to deal with it daily. So you might find that Tai Chi or yoga or running or guided imagery or um, some type of relaxation uh, can help with that and keep that at bay because you're getting some help from the medication. And I tell patients probably two of the most important things you can do in terms of, of self-care mental health wise that are just like maintenance issues rather than fixing the anxiety or depression but keeping them low are um, two kind of opposite ideas. It's guided imagery and um, a focused kind of meditation. It can be deep breathing, can be progressive muscle relaxation. And the difference between the two is the, the focused meditation is like being right here, right now. So I'm tensing up muscles and I'm focusing on one that feels like that I'm relaxing muscles and I'm training my muscles to release tension. When I train my muscles to release tension and I'm focusing on that, I'm also slowing down my brain. And the more I slow down my brain, the more I relax my body. And the more relaxed my body is, the more the slower my brain goes. 
So it starts a cycle that's the opposite of anxiety, which is my body begins to get excited and my mind begins to move and to race. And the more my brain races, the more my body says, well, what are we going to do? Where are we going to go? And starts to get excited. So the focus on here and now, and the two most popular of those are progressive muscle relaxation and some kind of deep breathing. Uh, great research behind both of those. Some patients like one and some patients like another. It, to me, it's a personal preference. But focusing on the here and now slows down your mind and relaxes your body. And that's the key to uh, particularly slowing down anxiety because anxiety is basically your body ramping up for warfare. It's ramping up for the big game. It's ramping up for what's next. And when you're trying to relax and you're trying not to get anxious, uh, you've got to take the bull by the horns and do one of those mind-body exercises. The other one is kind of the flip side where the focused meditation is the being here now. Guided imagery is let's not be here. Let's not be in the now. Let's go to the happy place. Or at least that's what they call it on TV. Hmm. Um, going to the happy place is uh, a, a guided imagery is basically saying, you know what? I think the most relaxed I was, was when I was laying on Pensacola Beach in 2018 at spring break. So I'm going to lay down. I'm going to imagine myself there. I'm going to remember what it smelled like. I'm going to remember what it felt like for the sun to hit my body. I'm going to remember how the sand felt underneath the beach blanket I was on. And boy, I think I can almost smell the salt water and I can hear the seagulls. Your brain is so powerful that you're not having an hallucination that you're there, but your body will actually respond as if you're at the beach. Okay. So what that does is that calms things down. Just like the focus meditation, it brings down your heart rate, your pulse. It changes the chemistry in your body from the energizing uh, cortisol and adrenaline. It changes to the relaxation things of oxytocin and serotonin and those things in your brain. So it's the getting out of the here and now and going to that happy place. And the nice thing about both the happy place and the focus meditation, the more you do them, more, the more powerful they get. And when you're on medication, sometimes medication loses its effectiveness because it has a tolerance effect. And so it takes more medication or you can have breakthroughs. But these two are both brain training exercises. And the more you train, the better you do. The more times I dribble a basketball, the better dribbler I am. The more times Michael Jordan shot free throws, the better he got at free throws. So when we practice this over and over, we train our brain very quickly to relax and to calm down. I had a patient one time who was in a motor vehicle accident and had some uh, muscular problems from that. And they taught him the progressive muscle relaxation. And he said uh, he had done it every day for 10 years. And I said, wow, I don't think I've ever but met anybody who has done this exercise 3,650 times. What's it like when you want to relax? And he said, you won't believe it. But all I have to do is think, I'm going to relax. And he said, I feel like I have no bones in my body and every muscle just lets loose. <laughs> well, that's a powerful technique if you're in a crisis situation or you're going in for scans and you're a little bit nervous about them. I'm going to relax. Boom. I go to my happy place. Yeah. Those are incredible tools for people to have in the toolbox. Yep. Um, to kind of follow up on that, it, if I'm a patient that is not at the point of needing that, what do you recommend for me to practice it? Because it sounds like those training wheels are so important to be able to get to that place mentally. Okay. So like, what kind of advice do you have for people that may not be fully down that road, but want to begin to like, you know, add the tools to their own toolbox for. Great, great, great analogy. I, I talk about toolboxes all the time because mm -hmm. most of my patients come in, not all of them are old enough, but most of them are old enough that they've had some crisis and they have some tools, but I always say that prevention is also a tool. So 
if you do maintenance on your car, why wouldn't you want to do maintenance for your mind and for your body? So the either one of those is good for um, a maintenance issue because if you practice uh, guided imagery and you can Google guided imagery and come up with tens of thousands of nice soft-spoken people with pianos in the background or soft guitars or waterfalls, if you practice that on a regular basis, you will drain the anxiety and tension out of your body regularly to the point that the chance of it building up goes from, uh, you know, high to low. And you're doing your body a favor by allowing it time to relax. Uh, as much as we, we need to move, uh, we also need to rest. And good physical therapists help their patients rest and move and rest and move. So I tell people it's the same way. I want you to focus on your cancer. I want you to focus on work. But then you have to have some time where you shut the screen off, you shut your mind off, and you go to the happy place or you do something that is totally self-care for your mind and your body. That's great. Um, we've had a couple more questions come through. Uh, Nora said, um, I have invasive breast cancer for almost six months now. They recommended a surgery for me. The doctor's busy, so I'm waiting for it to get scheduled. Um, what do you suggest um, in terms of helping while I wait for this operation? Well, Nora, I'm sorry you're having to wait. I tell you, nobody likes to wait. Uh, once you make a decision, it's like, let's go, let's go. Um, and it can be very hard to wait. Um, and, and cancer patients typically are, um, what's the right word, enervated by their diagnosis and they want their treatment as quickly as possible. But I think if you can say to yourself, uh, a couple of things in terms of the cognitive behavioral self-talk that we were talking about earlier. If you can say to, my, to yourself, you know what, I have to wait and it's hard to be patient, but they would not be putting off my surgery if it was going to endanger my health. So during this preparation time, I have extra time to prepare my mind and my body. And if I take this extra preparation time to reduce my anxiety and to learn to deal with it, um, then I will be um, more ready for the surgery. I'll be, be ready to relax when I have to deal with the post-surgery stuff. And when it comes time for um, dealing with some of the pain that might be involved or some of the physical therapy that might be involved, I will have relaxation tools in my toolbox that I am well equipped to deal with those because I practiced with those before I got to that event. So good for you for thinking ahead. That's a very good idea, Nora. And I would encourage you to think of that time, not as a postponement, but as a preparation. And what can Nora do to get ready for this and be like primed and ready and then ready for the parts that come after it? <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's really good advice. Nora, go to Tahiti in your mind every day between now and surgery. Yep, <laughs> yeah. exactly. Um, we had another another question come through from, um, I hope I'm pronouncing this right, Usha Devi. Um, Thanks for the valuable information about depression and loneliness in life. Um, some people have trouble um, during these times and then it leads them to behave negatively um, and think negatively. So, I, it, sorry, I'm like reading through. This doesn't seem to be exactly a question, but more of a commentary on how the negative thoughts lead to um, depression and anxiety. So any sort of commentary on the matter is appreciated. Okay. Um, that is a good insight that that the, what we think changes the way we behave. Um, and that's why I believe cognitive behavioral therapy is very powerful for cancer patients because they're basically um, 
taken out of the world that they're used to and put in a brand new world. Now they're dealing with doctors and specialties that they've never heard of before. They're taking drugs that they've seen on TV and hope they never needed before. Uh, so it's like a whole brand new world. And that takes some mental effort not to get so uh, immersed in that world. I try to tell my patients that it's important that you find a team that you trust. It's important that you uh, become an informed patient, but I don't want you to try to become a medical oncologist because your quality of life will go down if you start to study medicine while you're a patient. So the issue for patients is what do you do cognitively and behaviorally to increase your, your uh, quality of life. And one of the things, and the reason I entitled this talk, Dealing with Distress, is that distress is the overall blanket uh, term that we use in counseling for the thoughts and feelings that normal people have when bad things happen. The bad thing can be a tornado, hurricane blowing your house over, it can be being downsized at work, it can be getting a cancer diagnosis, it can be a recurrence of cancer, Whenever a crisis hits, most of us have new thoughts and feelings that pop up. Those thoughts and feelings, if they begin to take over our life, then cancer begins to own us. And people then begin to really suffer from cancer. There's enough suffering in cancer without making it worse for yourself. So I tell my patients, okay, you got a monster in your life. Let's see if we can't chain the monster up and keep him in the corner so that you can have a life, so that instead of suffering from cancer, you can live with cancer. So it's important to think of, okay, I need to monitor my distress and manage my distress. And I tell them that it's important to think about it uh, because uh, one of the things we know in counseling is if patients look at something, if a person pays attention to something or measures something, it will begin to change. So if I tell people, just start weighing yourself every morning at 7 a.m., write down how much you weigh. Some of those people are going to start losing weight, even though I didn't tell them to diet or exercise or anything, just because they're looking at their weight. In nursing, they're starting to call distress the seventh vital sign. And what I tell my patients is when they come to our center, I want them to think, gee, they're going to take all these other measurements of how I'm doing. I want to step in the door and say, Tell me how I'm doing or even think about every day. How am I doing? And then say, is there anything I can do to lower my distress? See, my distress might be a seven out of 10 on the thermometer. And I might say, you know what? I got cancer and the treatment's rough. And I, and there's, I can't get this back to zero where I'm used to living. But gee, if we can take it from seven to six, then maybe we're on our way to a five. So begin to measure it and think about it. But then begin to think about what can you do to begin to manage it. When distress is unmanaged, it leaks out of our thoughts and into our behaviors. So I tell people, ask your support team. Are you as friendly and outgoing as you used to be? Are you cranky and short-tempered? If that's the case, then your distress is not being contained inside you. It's leaking out to your relationships. And they can tell you, when distress is starting to get to you and you need to do something about it. So that was a good insight that it's not just what we think, it's how we behave. And I think it's very important for patients, for people, if you're in a relationship to hear the other person on how they think you're doing, because they don't have a clue what's going on inside, but they also have a very good insight because they're not, um, they're not uh, sidetracked by the feelings. When I tell you how I'm doing, um, I can easily, easily tell you, well, I'm a really generous person. But the people around me can say, no, Mike, remember when we did this? You didn't give any money. You didn't do this. So it's good to have that feedback so that I'm paying attention to my internal life by looking at my own thoughts. But I'm also getting feedback from other people with behaviors. And that's why I think cognitive behavioral therapy is so good for cancer patients. Hmm. That's, um, that's really interesting insight. Kind of building on that, we had another comment from Julia. Um, 
I was diagnosed with ovarian cancer in 2015. I had a radical hysterectomy and six rounds of chemo. In late 2016, my doctor told me the cancer had come back. I completed another 12 rounds of chemo and following tests showed no further issues. I have been cancer free for five year, uh, for the last five years. However, last month I found out that my cancer is back with liver mets. I am terrified because metastatic ovarian cancer has a bad prognosis. I can't take it. You can see that it's more of a, a comment than a question, but I'm sure that it's a narrative that you've heard before in practice. What, you know, what do you say? How do you even begin to comfort somebody who just says the words, I am terrified? Yeah, yeah. Well, Julie, I'm sorry that your cancer has returned. Um, that's one of the very negative things about cancer is it has a tendency to pop back up. I would encourage you, though, to pay attention to what you say to yourself. First of all, yes, it is a shock, and of course you hope it doesn't come back, but almost every patient who has cancer and then finds himself in a period of no evidence of disease has a fear of recurrence. So that's a very common um, kind of post-treatment issue. Um, and what the resolve that you use to fight this um, in 2015 and 16, um, you're going to have to muster that up and get that toolbox out again. Um, and I, I try to help my patients not focus too much on the prognosis. Um, I know that's difficult, but you never know uh, which group you're in. Even if the odds are against you, you don't know. Um, there's a reason people play the lottery. Uh, you're more likely to get uh, struck by lightning and bit by a shark on the same day than win the lottery. But if you win, oh boy. So I tell people that you can't say the odds are against me because you don't know which group you're in. So rather than allowing the prognosis to taint your worldview, you have to say, oh my goodness, I, I, I may be in a tough spot, but I got a chance. Uh, there was a lady on one of the um, talent shows uh, a few months back. You can Google this YouTube video. Uh, everybody felt sad for her. And she said, you don't understand. I got a 10% chance of beating this. Well, I don't know that I could be that cheerful and go on TV and, and crow about having a 10% chance. But you know what? 10 out of 100 patients are going to be in that group. So I think you have to almost say, you know what? I don't know what group I'm in. And that is a terrifying thought. But how do I, how do I deal with that fear so that it doesn't consume my life? Because basically what I tell my patients, Julia, is that if you allow that fear to consume your life, then cancer just one day, won this day today. So the goal is, how do I live a good quality of life in spite of that fact? Not because of that fact. Nobody would want to have those odds. Nobody would want to be in that situation. But I tell patients that, and I think this is real, and this is this is helping them program their mind. None of us know how many days we have. None of us. And cancer patients are more aware of that than the general population. And I think that's one of the, the benefits of working with cancer patients. It reminds me every day of how precious life is. And if life is precious and I don't have no matter how many days I have, I have to make sure that I pay attention to quality of life. So I tell my patients, it really doesn't matter if you really knew that you had 10 days, 10 weeks, 10 months, 10 decades. The goal is to fill the days you do have with the best possible quality of life. And that you actually have more control over. So I try to help my patients change the focus from the quantity of life, which the doctors and the team and medical science are working on. But the patient really has, a, I think, a small part to play in that where the patient has a large part to play is quality of life. The patient can have good quality of life. And one of the things I like about my hospital is that my patients are around 
some people who are very sick, but very cheerful. And it's like, gee, if they can be in that group and they can be that sick and they can have that poor prognosis, but they're having a good day today and they're laughing and they're, why can't I have that kind of day? And the answer is you can have just about any kind of day you want. Now, you may not be able to choose your diagnosis. You may not be able to choose your prognosis. You may not be able to choose your chemo or the side effects, but there is a piece of control that's left to you. That's what you think and what you do. And the research shows that in terms of happiness, what we think and what we do is three times more powerful than our situation. I know it's hard to believe that sometimes, but they show with great research when they look at what makes people happy and what makes people unhappy. What they find is what people think and do is about 45% of the problem and our circumstances are about 15%. Well, what that says to me as a counselor is, gee, if we're gonna have a hard time changing your situation, that tiny 15%, let's work on the 45 and make it beat up on the 15. Let's make the 45 more powerful and put it in charge of the situation. So Julia, I'm sorry that you got bad news, but remember you beat this once, you can beat it mm -hmm. again. Good words. Um, Nora asked, can I eat anything? You know, sort of such a simple question, but are there any <laughs> sort of <laughs> food, food related recommendations from your perspective? Well, I, I'm, I'm not a nutritionist or a dietitian. I would encourage you to ask somebody else. Um, it seems like everybody has an opinion on this. Um, I just am cautious to tell my patients that there is no cancer proofing diet. If there was, we would not have cancer patients in America. Um, but we do know there are some things that are more healthy than others. And I would encourage you to eat things that are healthy. Um, whether you have cancer or not, it's good encouragement to eat what's healthy. Mm -hmm. But in particular, um, that's a question that should be asked of somebody who knows your treatment plan because different medications can, can deplete you of different nutri nutrition and ni nutrients and things. Uh, so it's important that you have a dietitian or a nutritionist on your team that can look at your treatment plan look at the, the treatment that you're getting and say, radiation patients need this. Patients on, um, on uh, levid, nivolumab need this and that sort of thing, because they're looking at helping you deal with side effects. Yeah, no, that's fair. Um, Nora, you can certainly come on to Anka Power and, and sort of seek further advice. Obviously getting like a tailored nutrition game plan going is is always advised. Um, we had another question come in from Young. My husband is a non-small cell lung cancer stage three adenocarcinoma um, patient. Recently, it has spread to the bone. He has been struggling with severe neuropathic pain from chemo. This has led him to have suicidal thoughts several times because of these bone mets and, and neuropathy. Um, how do I comfort or give hope to someone in his position? Well, that's a great question in a desperate situation. Um, first of all, um, I would encourage you to um, seek out some pain management specialists um, because cancer pain is very, very difficult and very, very painful. If you read about the opioid crisis, um, they all talk about not doing this and not doing this, except for cancer patients. And that's because cancer patients need good pain management. Neuropathy can be a very difficult situation. Um, and I would encourage him to start with dealing with the pain and then also at the same time, concurrently dealing with someone uh, from the counseling, behavioral health, mental health field about how difficult it is to have that much pain and to think that maybe the only way to stop it is to end your life because A, that's not true, but B, it's easy to get that desperate. And my experience tells me that desperate people sometimes do things impulsively 
And it's the impulses that we have to stop because most people want to live. Um, when my cancer patients come and they talk about, man, some days I just wish I wouldn't wake up. It's because of the pain. It's not that they don't want to live another day. It's not that they don't want to see their spouse another day, their grandkids another day. It's just that they don't want another day of pain. So helping your husband find a place that can help him at least turn down the pain and manage the pain, but then also manage the distress um, and the distressing feelings that lead him to the thoughts of, gee, the only way to get out of this is to end it all. And I, can, I cannot encourage you enough to do that very, very quickly and almost immediately because that's almost like a 911 call. Um, Mike, I don't see any further questions coming through just yet. So I'm going to give a few minutes in case people want to, you know, ask additional questions. Okay. Are there any resources that you find to just be fantastic for, you know, for patients as they're going through this journey or for families, caregivers going through this journey, um, to, you know, just on, excuse me, any side of the diagnosis. Okay, good question. Um, yeah, a couple of things. Number one, I tell people that when you hear your name and the word cancer in the same sentence, it's a little bit like that moment in Jaws where Richard Dreyfus and Robert Shaw are saying, how are we going to find this big shark in this giant ocean? And Roy Scheider is throwing chum off the back of the boat and Jaws shows up and Richard Scheider has his most famous line, where he says, I think we're going to need a bigger boat. Cancer is a time when you're going to need a bigger boat. And by boat, what I mean is support. So you need to build a support team around you, a treatment team around you. And so I encourage patients to figure out how to get all of the players that they need, how to get more people to bring them casseroles, cut their lawn, all of those things that can help them improve their quality of life. The one book that I think I found the most helpful that a patient gave me is called Chemo Heart. I forget the author's name, but it is written by a counselor who is a cancer survivor. And it's a two or three page uh, little readings like essays that talk about the things that he found that helped him. And now he specializes in helping cancer patients. Uh, so the book is called Chemo Heart. And then I would encourage anybody who has questions about the place I work to visit uh, cancercenter.org, uh, Cancer Treatment Centers of America. Or if they have follow-up questions for me, I'd be glad to have them contact me through my website, which is mikeuhl.pro, M-I-K-E-U-H-L dot P-R-O. So those are some of the ones I would recommend off the top of my head, Whitney. Very, very helpful. Thank you. Um, sorry, before I had to cough. So excuse my like swallowing my own voice there. <laughs> You're okay. <laughs> I didn't notice that you said it. <laughs> um, so it doesn't look like any further questions are coming through. I think we'll begin to wind down the conversation. Is there anything else that you think is really sort of, you know, having had meaning in your, your career or, or things that you find that you're always kind of um, going back to with patient care that you wanna mention? Um, I would just applaud everybody who showed up tonight because it shows that you're interested in improving the quality of your, of your life. And I would encourage you to, rem to remind yourself that self-care is not selfishness. Selfishness is I put on my own oxygen mask and I don't help you. Self-care is I put mine on so that I can help you put yours on. And self-care is very, very important throughout all stages of life, but particularly when you're under the pressure and in the distress of dealing with cancer. So I would encourage you to turn uh, your interest that you showed today by showing up for this uh, seminar, turn it into positive action. You've heard some new ways of thinking about things and maybe it stimulated some thoughts or challenged some thoughts you had, but I would encourage you to go out and do something different that's going to help you feel better so that you can heal better. Hmm. 
Beautifully said. Thank you. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. This has been really incredible. Mike, it's been, it's been so wonderful to have your expertise on board. I feel like I've learned so much. Um, Thank you, oh, one, sorry, one last question coming through. Right. Um, is, is there any kind of structured program that patients may utilize um, and, and get the benefit of your services from? Um, well, I have a private practice that, I, and I gave you the website. Um, programmatically, I'm not sure um, who all offers these services. I usually refer my patients if they're trying to find somebody local to the American Cancer Society uh, the, in their local area, because what you want, I, I encourage them to interview the counselor that they're um, uh, thinking about working with, because you're gonna pay the counselor, the counselor works for you. Interview them and find out what experience they have with either A, cancer or chronic illnesses. Um, I would have said 10 years ago before I started working with Cancer Treatment Centers of America, you know, I don't know much, but I'll figure it out. I would not want my patients to go to somebody who's working on figuring it out because mm -hmm. it's too much of a crisis. It's too much pressure, too much distress. You need someone who has already experienced. Um, so I would just encourage you to shop until you could find the right person. But if you're living in an area where you can't, I would encourage you to, to look through your insurance company for telehealth. 60% um, of patients who have experienced telehealth never wanna go back to the counselor's office. So there's gonna be booming telehealth and interview somebody and find somebody who has some experience with cognitive behavioral therapy for anxiety and depression. If you can't find somebody who has chronic illness or cancer uh, uh, experience, because I, I'm convinced um, there's lots of therapies that work. And always the question is what, what kind of therapy fits the population the best? And I'm convinced that cognitive behavioral therapy fits the best because the distress wants to program your mind in a negative way. It almost acts like the cancer is a person who wants you to be depressed and scared out of your mind. To, to combat that, to push back against that, you have to have a strong mind, a good, a good computer that you're programming with good software. So cognitive behavioral therapy, if you can't find somebody experienced with cancer treatment. Very helpful. Mike, thank you so much for your expertise tonight. We really appreciate it. Thank you for the opportunity, Whitney. Yeah. So uh, just... Just to recap for everyone um, on OncoPower, we do have uh, tools and resources for both patients and providers. Um, we are wholly dedicated to making sure that we sort of simplify some of the onco oncology care process because it's just so much to undertake. Um, and so, you know, join us today. We are really here to support you in your battle and, um, we look forward to continuing these live sessions and connecting you with experts. Thank you.